Please note that in this show, you might hear graphic descriptions or language that may not be appropriate for everyone. Listener discretion advised. Grief doesn't ever go away. I told you before our show, I had this big, huge cry of just like, gosh, I haven't thought about this stuff for so long. I miss her so much. God, I wish I could talk to her right now. So it's never gone, but it changes and it's different. And it's not as hard for me as it was in the beginning. I hope that that is hopeful advice, both to my former self and anyone who might be in it in that season. Hey there, thanks for stopping in the Parentless Podcast. My name is Stephanie and I am your host. I wanted to give you just a couple little updates here before we move into our episode this week. I know that if you've been listening and looking for episodes every week, those aren't happening, but you know, the interviews are still happening and the show will go on and we will be getting more interviews out as we go. So thank you so much for being patient with me. So today's episode is featuring Melissa Pinnell. She is a writer and an author and a mom and a coach and so many things. So this is a message that Melissa sent me to share with you here. I now have journals for mothers and daughters and mothers and sons. And those are called Questions You'll Wish You Asked, a time capsule journal for mothers and daughters and mothers and sons. Then this Friday on 9, 10, 21, the journals for dads are released. If you happen to listen on 9, 9 and you want to get a copy, you can pre-order that. But those are called Questions You'll Wish You Asked, a time capsule journal for fathers and daughters and a time capsule journal for fathers and sons. You can find them by heading to followyourfirecoaching.com or by searching on Amazon. Just make sure that my name is listed as the author since people love to pirate these. That is no joke. People just somehow reprint the book and don't add her name to it. And it's a pirated copy. That's crazy. So don't support those guys. Definitely support Melissa. All right, Melissa, take it away. Hello, my name is Melissa Pennell, and I am 36 years old. I'm a mother, I'm a writer, I'm a life coach, I have a podcast, but I'm also a daughter. And I think relationally, that's sort of how I think of myself as we're about to have this conversation. And I live in California uh, with my partner up in Northern California. And yeah, I'm so happy to be on the show and able to take sort of a pause in this area of my life and, and share it with you. So thank you for that. Tell me, who are you here for? Who died for you and who is your person? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me on. And it, it was so kind of timely. Stephanie sends us questions before the podcast just to sort of give an idea of what we're going to talk about. And I just found even pausing with those questions that we may or may not talk about on this show was so cathartic and, and just, it's just like a place that a lot of us parentless people don't really spend time. It's like this, um, when I say dark corner, I don't mean shameful corner, but just this part of ourselves we don't often visit. So I'm just excited to be here again. And to answer your question, my person was my mom, uh, Delise, that was her name. And, um, yeah, and I forgot if you asked me more about that, but she died Uh, About seven and a half years ago now, she died November 26th of 2013. And I had just turned 29 and she was 56. And yeah, that's when I lost her. Now, you also told me about your dad and his place in your life. So before we kind of get in with your mom, let's tell me, I guess, take me to the beginning. You were a baby. What happened? (laughs) Yeah, we're going to tell my whole life story. (laughs) Don't worry, guys, you don't have to tune out yet. So I will touch on my dad because I do think it has an impact on my story, just like, you know, everyone's parents do, whether they're present or not. And my dad wasn't present. I have an older brother. And when my older brother was born, my mom, I think, had expected or hoped that his antics, which included drug abuse and just partying and essentially all the stuff that doesn't really comply or agree with being a parent. She was hoping that would end and it didn't. It got worse, which can definitely happen. So I was born when I came along, which was about a year and a half after my brother was born. We're 18 months apart. She gave him an ultimatum and said, either you stop doing the drugs and start acting like a father or you have to leave. And he chose to leave. And this is all told to me because I was a baby and then, you know, a kid and 
just went through life without him, but he would always like somehow get in touch for the years after that, like call someone in the family and not necessarily try and come home, but just give like a signal, like a smoke signal that he was still alive out there doing God knows what. But then he stopped calling. I think when I was around, it was, it was a long time, long enough that my mom assumed he had died. And a lot of this was before the internet. So she didn't really have like an easy way to track him down. She tried once to do like a, I think she might've, I don't know if she went as far as hiring an investigator, but just out of curiosity, like, is this man out there? Is he still alive? Couldn't find him. But then when I was 20, we got a phone call and I still live with my mom at this point. And it was him. He had called actually my grandmother, whose number hadn't changed. My mom's mom gotten in touch with us. And the, essentially his message was, uh, I'm alive. I'm living in Florida and I'm dying and I want to come home. And he did just to kind of expedite that story. He did end up coming home. We lived in a little town outside Sacramento called Real Linda. That's where he had been born and raised. Actually, he wasn't born there, but that's where he would like had left us. So he came back, but he took a year to come back. So he had throat cancer. And in that time, I was just kind of here. I was excited to hear that he was alive. Like my mom had done this really good job of not really bad mouthing him, even though he had completely abandoned her and never supported her and, you know, left her with two small kids and nothing. She was like, I'm so impressed with that in retrospect, because I didn't really have ill will toward him. I thought of him the way she talked about him, which was, he was sick. Like he had a sickness addiction. Anyway, he ended up coming back. But by that, the time he actually got here to Northern California, his cancer had progressed a lot. So I remember meeting him and I walked into this room he was in and I was so struck by, we have the exact same eyes. And I'd always been told that, but to see them was just such a trip as like a 20 year old that had all these mixed emotions about like, I've never met you, but you're my dad. I'm half of you genetically, but you're a complete stranger. So he was really emaciated. He had completely wasted away in that year. I assume he hadn't always looked like that. And um, he actually died three months later. And in that three months, I went to see him every day. I did things like printed out pictures of my brother and I growing up and said like, look, we played Little League and I did gymnastics and this was me at graduation. And here, let me catch you up on the entire life that you missed of ours. My brother didn't want to have anything to do with him, by the way. So I was just kind of like the speaker for the group. Yeah. And I saw him every day. And then I was there when he passed away as he was getting close to the end. And I'd never been there to see someone die before. And it was really hard, right? To see, like, I remember I was holding this baby book of his. I don't know how we ended up with this, but somehow in his reentry, this photo album of his like childhood had ended up in my lap. And I was looking at these pictures of him as a baby and seeing him across the room as this like completely wasted away, dying man who in a lot of ways demonstrated like the saddest parts of being human. Like he missed out on his kids' life. He never really like made much of his own life. As far as we knew, he had been in and out of prison. He didn't have anyone like he came home because we were his people and he hadn't even seen us in 20 years. So it was very, um, very sad. And in a lot of ways, I don't think I consciously knew this, but it was sort of like this. So this is what I don't want. Like, this is how I don't want to die. And it was just very heartbreaking. And also just to add that the last bit about dad's death is I also had this weird conflict in my grief because I had been raised by my mom. She'd never left me. And I felt very strange being really torn up about his death because it's like, is that, is that unfair to her to be fucked up about this, which I really was. So I didn't really allow myself that grief and I drank it. I started to, it's interesting because he had been an, an addict and a lot of like a cautionary tale for me of like, don't live like this. This is what happens when you're a drug addict. You hurt people, you leave your family, you die alone, um, you waste your life. And yet that somehow didn't wire together with, um, it, it felt good to escape my feelings, right? So after that, I started drinking a lot. This would fast forward through my 20s. I became a drug addict. I became my dad in a lot of ways. I didn't know that at the time, but that's why even though he wasn't my person, I think his lack of presence 
brief appearance in my life. And then death really had an impact on the person I am. And I guess I became, especially back then. Yeah. And I have to break in here before we turned on the recording, we, we said, do we want to talk about dad? And I'm so glad that we did because what this guy has impacted your life so hard. And he was like, you said, gone for most of it. Wow. And then for you having those three months with him while you saw him in his like worst state of life. I'm really glad that we're talking about this because I think that's super important. Just, just like we talked about when, when did your dad pass away? He passed away in 2006 and I was, I always forget if I was 21 or 22. I think I was 21 and then I turned 22 that year. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely, it was right. It's like this. um, And and again, thank you for giving me a space to talk about this because similarly, like this is for my life. I just never visit. And in some ways I feel like, When you've been raised by a single parent um, who was as there for me as my mom was, it's really easy to discount that other parent, even if the impact they had on us was their absence or was their stories, because a lot of what I know of him was his stories. And I have to say, too, I think that, again, I became it was a slow progression. I didn't just go from, you know, my dad died. Now I'm a drug addict. I very slowly realized that. I could drink away my feelings and I wasn't sad if I was drunk. And then I found Vicodin and I wasn't sad if I was numb. And, and so this progression, um, definitely, you know, brought me to my knees years later. But, um, I, I guess what I wanted to say is I sort of weirdly idolized him, which is so strange, but I think that because he was this mystery, like this, um, he was a very handsome man when he was young. He was very like, uh, the stories that my mom would share probably to try not to badmouth him just made him sound like very adventurous and kind of cool. And like, yeah, of course he left the family because there's a big world out there. And wow, I want to be like that. And, and I bring that up because that's also part of my hurt with my mother is that she kind of watched me like uh, romanticize this person who in all reality, not to, you know, knock him, but like he was, kind of a deadbeat, (laughs) you know, I sort of made this story up so that I could have, I think, a relationship with him in retrospect, but, but it definitely added to my grief when I did lose my mom eventually, because I realized that just for example, I remember once I was in Toastmasters, which if you're not familiar, it's um, like a speech giving, they teach you how to speak publicly group. And I decided to give a speech on my dad and his dad, and I was practicing it with her and she was giving me feedback and telling me, you know, what a great job I was doing. And I'm going to go kick their butts and, you know, good luck, Melissa. And now I think about that. And it's like, gosh, I was celebrating him and his life. And, you know, I'm not trying to put myself down for that too much in my naivety, but it's like, I feel really bad that she watched that. And she, she was so much more important in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. I I don't know. I think maybe that was her gift to you as a mom. I, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know your life. I don't know. I've known you for like 10 minutes. So how, who am I to speak on this? But, you know, just as we are as parents now, and you'll, you might get into that when you start talking about her, but what that would have taken for her to, to just like you said, and, and, you know, if she had sat there and bad mouthed him your whole life, when he came back in the end, you probably wouldn't just like your brother, you may not have wanted to even spend that time with him. You would have had a completely different picture of him. And then I don't know if you call it a blessing or appreciate the time that you had at the end. I'm sure you do, but, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have had that time if you had a different view of him. So I don't know. I think that was like her gift that she gave to you. Yeah. I I love that perspective. And I, and I have to agree. And I'm also like, wow, mom, how did you do that? Because I'm, I don't know if I'm that great a person. I think that I'd be like, Hey, why are you giving a speech on him? I mean, I don't know, (laughs) but I think, I think that it was a really beautiful gift. And it, again, it's something in retrospect in her life, I can now really appreciate like, wow, the power it must have taken to have gone through what you did as a single mother with no support. And also thinking about that she welcomed him back too. that I wouldn't have had this chance to meet him had she not said, here, you know, I'll allow you access to our lives, even though you really kind of screwed this up. So yeah, exactly. Was- who who gets to leave for 20 years and then come back like in the worst days of your life, like, and be welcome in, welcome in. Wow. He was, he was lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And- he definitely was. Yeah. It was, 
And so much to stuff, I feel like as we get older, this is how I think, you know, grief or loss can change so much with time that the way I look at him now at 36 is far different than I looked at him at 25 or 22 when I lost him. The way I look at my mom now, you know, almost, you know, seven and a half years past her death. It's interesting how as we change, these relationships don't go away. They simply shift because it's like our perspective is at a different level and we're able to look at them and and even ourselves differently. So I guess I like that thought too, because I think so much of what is difficult about loss is this like, well, their human form is gone. That's it. You know, never got to know my dad or never get to hug my mom again. And these things are true and they suck. And this paradox doesn't make that any easier. But I think it's kind of neat to realize just because they're gone doesn't mean the relationship is. It's totally alive and changes. In the years after his death, I actually moved to L.A. to be an actor, which was a a whole adventure and lots of ups and downs. And it's also the place where I realized how deeply insecure I was and how little I knew myself and how... Um, easy it was to get caught up in what other people thought of me. and All that wrapped itself into a severe addiction that took a while to really ramp up. But when it did, it got really bad at the end. And I was doing things mostly in secret until they all came out that were like in such opposition to the way that I was raised. Like I was raised to be honest and accountable and kind and, um, an addiction, uh, I always try and like kind of qualify. This isn't a get out of jail free card card. It's not like, well, you know, the drugs made me do it, but it is something that makes you someone that you're not and doing things that you would never do. And it's, you know, having just talked about my dad, it made me understand a lot more like why when someone said, Hey, do you want to be a dad or keep being a drug addict? He chose addiction because it doesn't really feel like a choice when you're in it. And all that to say, I did get sober I wanted to be sober for a long time, but it was my life completely falling apart that got me there. And I was in LA. I lost my job because I was being dishonest and I got found out. I had my car repossessed because I had stopped making payments, which that's what they do when you don't make payments is they repossess your car. I got kicked out of the place that I lived. My boyfriend at the time found out I was an addict. I I basically, my whole house of cards just like to the ground. And who did I have left? But my mom, she had always, always been there, sometimes codependently, I know now, sometimes just because that's what mothers do. And I came home to live with her and and she said that I could say if I was sober and I wanted to be sober and I tried to be and I did a lot more screwing up at home and then eventually I got sober. But I bring that up because my life was really, really rocky there at the end. And then I had a year of sobriety. And getting sober is about so much more than just stopping the drugs. It's like changing everything in your life and the people and your interactions. And you do this inventory where you hopefully realize why you were an addict in the first place. But I was a bit selfish in this year. I think a lot of us have to be because you have this very fragile new gift of sobriety. And that has to come before everything. Because if I didn't get sober, I couldn't be a good daughter. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get myself out of this very deep hole I had dug for myself. But again, I bring that up because the last year of her life, um, I was very, very immersed in recovery. I was living in like sober living houses. I was in touch with her for sure, but I was all about my sober friends. I remember the last Thanksgiving we spent together on holidays in recovery communities. They have things that are like marathon meetings that you can go to. They last all night and all day. So if you don't feel safe with your family, if you don't have a family, if there's a reason you might drink on that day, you have a place to go. And I had a family, but I really wanted to go to a marathon meeting. I remember itching to leave my mom's house because it's like, oh, I want to go and like talk recovery and be with my friends. And so again, that was a tough thing about her death is that she died right after this very self-centered year of mine that thank God I was sober, but it's not like I was really present with her or really even like doing a living amends is what they call it. When you've been a total fuck up, like I was, you don't just get to say, sorry, you get to live differently. And I didn't really get much time to do that with her because she, she, she died. So I guess I should get to that. She died in her sleep unexpectedly. Um, that was November of 2013. 
And she had had diabetes, like type two diabetes, the like couple years before that. She had been overweight my whole life, by the way, like morbidly obese, up and down. Weight was her issue. Like food was her coping mechanism. And I bring that up because since she had been overweight my whole life, I didn't really think of that as like, a, and it doesn't, um, weight doesn't necessarily indicate health. I know that now. I think that's a really important thing to say. But I didn't have this like awareness that she could die soon. It had just felt like, well, she doesn't take care of herself. And she didn't take care of her diabetes. She was often not eating the way she was supposed to and telling me that her doctor had said, I remember very astutely this conversation we had maybe a month or two before she died, where she came home from the doctor and I had stopped by her house because I would stop by at least once a week from like my sober living facility. Actually, by then I lived on my own. By the time she died, I had just gotten my own apartment. But anyway, she said that at the doctor, I'm not versed in type 2 diabetes anymore, but I believe it's her A1C. There was this particular indication that was out of control. And her doctor had said, if you don't get this under control, you could die within a year. And he gave her this very dire, like, I'm sure he was trying to warn her, like, you you can't let your, like, this isn't okay. Your, your levels are unsafe. And I remember her telling it to me and, and kind of almost like this defiant child where she was like, can you believe he said that? Can you believe he said that I could die? And I think looking back, especially with more like psychological awareness, I think it was a lot of defensiveness and probably fear. Like it's easier to get mad at this doctor than it is to look at my health and the seriousness of this conversation. And I remember at that moment, I started crying because I felt like, mom, this sounds really scary. Your doctor told you it's likely that you could die within a year. That sounds really scary. Please do something differently. And that was essentially how a lot of our relationship had gone, where I had felt so frustrated at my lack of ability to control how how her health was or how she was treating her body or how depressed she was. She also struggled with depression a lot, especially in the last couple of years. So it was unexpected. And again, I think it could have been expected because I literally had a conversation with her in the two months before where her doctor said you could die. So it's weird how those can coexist. And and I mentioned this to you before, I think, um, maybe not, but that I, I do think also there's this feeling that our parents are immortal. Like there was just this feeling that I had that even if my logical brain knew she's not living very healthy, healthfully, whatever that word is, it's like, well, she can't die. She'll just, you know, get sick or not feel well, or her doctor will give her a diagnosis. But I mean, it wasn't even on the radar for me. So it really took me by surprise when she passed away. How did you hear about her passing? Um, I was at work. I was a waitress. I had gotten a job as a waitress and I had just gotten to work and my brother called and someone said, your brother's on the phone. And I was like, why would my brother be calling? And then I got on the phone with him and he was crying and he said, you have to come home. He lived with my mom and he wouldn't tell me why. And actually maybe like three months before that, my, my dad's dad had died and it was kind of a big thing that my mom found out on the phone. She was very upset about that. She was like, people should not find out about death on the phone. And, and again, I think that was her just getting angry about something because she was really sad, but I, I knew, okay, this is a thing in our family. If there's really bad news, you don't give it on the phone. He won't tell me what's wrong. So I knew that was it. I didn't know no yet, but yeah. And then I went home and she had passed away in her sleep. She was lying in the bed. She looked like she was just asleep. We'll never forget that image. I think it's one of those things that sticks with you forever. And I'm also, I, I will pause to say, even though it was the most like heartbreaking night of my life, just like squat the floor next to my dead mother and her hand was... I hope I'm not going into too much detail, but her hand was stiff. And that's because she had actually died a long time before that. Like my brother had just thought she was sleeping late because she did that sometimes. And, and I, it was traumatic, right. To see this person that you've only known alive dead. It feels so empty to say, but what I will say is that I'm also really glad I got that moment because I think that there is some sort of 
catharsis in that finality and being able to see the person after they've died. And I bring that up because even though I've honestly felt, I always wish I'd known, like I've always thought, gosh, I I'm kind of jealous of people, even though there's total heartbreak either way, when you're having to watch your parents suffer and, you know, die slowly versus them being taken quickly. I always wish I'd known. And, and I think the bit of writing that you might've seen that you saw on the motherless mother's page that we're on is that my mom had called me the night before that. And I had ignored her call and she had thought I was coming over. She had like completely gotten her wires crossed. And I had, I had come over the night before that I'd seen her two days before she died. And she had seen a text. I think I sent that night and thought, Oh, she's coming over. So the last voicemail I got from my mom is just wondering when you'll be here. I'm looking forward to seeing you. And then she yawns. And and I, I bring that up because she ended up dying in her sleep. And that yawn just haunted me because it was like, that was, this is so dramatic to say, but like the sleep of death, like that was what was coming. And I didn't know that. And and I bring that moment up too, because again, I didn't call her back. I didn't come over that regret. Um, periodically haunts me. I, I don't want to act like it's just like something I've completely healed from. I think that like many parts of grief, there are waves where, you know, one day it will feel really shitty that I missed that chance. But anyway, I know I kind of just took a turn. I was just really glad that even though I didn't have any warning that I did get to see her because um, I needed that. It already didn't even feel real. I remember it was probably a month after she died having a total breakdown. And my brother and I, who we were not close, we are not close. We're civil to each other at this point, but it wasn't like we had each other to hold through this. It felt very much like we were both on our own islands, to borrow that phrase, in our grief. And I went over to his house and I was like, are we sure she was dead? Like, what if we had shaken her harder? And even thinking of that now, it's just so heartbreaking because it's like, she she had literally had a, a medical bracelet because the paramedics had declared her dead. She was dead. But the little girl in me that my mom always worked nights too, I should say, and she would sleep during the day. So I was very used to having to work to wake her up. Like, mom, I need you to sign this paper, mom. And like all the obnoxious things kids do. And it was like that little girl was alive. Like I should have just shaken her harder. Like we, it's our fault. And I was 29. Like, I was a fully, I mean, yeah, I newly sober wasn't completely clear, but I just think it's an example of what that kind of heartache does to our head where we lose all sense of logic. So I feel like I just went on a deep, deep tangent. Thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> all tangents are welcome. They're all important. I think there is something about that moment of, of the finality. Like you said, how do you feel like your life has been changed by the death of your parents? Hmm. Yeah. And you know what, even though it feels like so obvious, I'm also really grateful that you ask it because I think when we pause and, and this is, um, I mentioned, I work as a coach. That's a lot of what coaching is, is asking these really obvious questions that if you actually pause with them and you're honest can be so life-changing and, and stuff. I'll just share that when I was looking at this question before our call, I had like a giant cry with this question and, um, a few others that we may or may not get to. So, so all of this dancing around that to say the simplest way and, and the not pretty shiny way I'll answer is that it's just made me feel less safe. I think that for me, I was lucky enough to grow up with this mom who covered the world in a film is almost how it felt. And that film was, even though this world is fucked up and there's lots that goes wrong and you've dealt with things and, and life wasn't perfect, you're sturdy. Like there's a solid foundation beneath you. And that foundation cracked open the day she died. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't say I have built a very sturdy foundation on my own through my own work and spirituality. And I think diving straight into that grief and just allowing myself to realize like all, all that to say, I think both are true. I have built a foundation since her death, but it's just not the same, right? It's just, it's not as secure. And, and this is, this is like an interesting tangent, but I'll, I'll mention it because I think it kind of demonstrates this. Last year, I had a friend move across the country on a whim. She moved from California to Mississippi and she was like, I'm moving. I'm going to take my van and my animals. And like, I was so impressed with it. And I was also like, you know what? I feel like 
I remember I mentioned to my partner, I was like, I don't think she would have felt as confident doing this if she didn't have parents that she knew. Like, for example, her van is like 20 years old and on its last legs. And I was like, I would have to really think about like, how am I going to bail myself out if something goes wrong, either on this trip, in this new state, like you, you get very independent when you know you don't have, cause I should also mention, I didn't just lose my mom. I really don't have family. My, my grandparents are all gone. She didn't have any brothers and sisters. Like we, we don't have, like, I have my hubby's family, but it's different. You know, I'm grateful for them, but they're not people I would call and be like, oh, I need bail me out. <laughs> right. And I was telling my partner, Michael, I was like, I just feel like if she didn't know she could call someone to save her, she wouldn't do it this kind of haphazardly. And then he was like, you know, I don't know that. Like, I think she's just the kind of person who wants to move and she feels like it. And she does basically calling me out on not everyone thinks like you, Melissa, like maybe this is, and he didn't um, actually say all of this, but I was like, I kind of had to take a look at my own fears that I think it did give me this feeling that I have to look out for any potential danger. I have to plan very well. I have to have savings. I have to, I have to be able to bail myself out because I don't have anybody. And that's, again, that's a very dramatic statement. I have a partner, I have good friends, but that feeling, I think being parentless, at least for myself and maybe someone listening can relate. There's just a different sort of support that I think you get if you had really good parents. And once they're gone, that support is gone too. Yeah. We just talked about how the deaths of your parents has impacted your life, especially your mom. Of all of these things that we just talked about, is there one or a few that you think has had the most impact on your life? Yeah. I think that something that manifested after my mom's death was just the awareness of how much anxiety I have. And, and it's something when I think back, I think I was always an anxious kid that thought a lot. I was always kind of fearful. I remember my mom saying, even as a baby, I was very cautious and that translated to thinking a lot as an adult and often thinking a lot equals anxiety, but that really expanded after she was gone. And I started to really worry about, I think to whether you've lost a parent or simply lived through something that was traumatic, which I think loss is, you know, something that's greatly changed your worldview from like one day to the next. It, it introduces this possibility of, well, that can happen again. Like I could get a call on another random Tuesday that something happened to Michael, my partner or Tilly, my daughter. And that, I mean, having kids brought a whole new level of that into play. So yeah, I think that it definitely, and, and I say that also acknowledging that is the reason, I mean, I am such a mental health dork. Like I got a therapist pretty much right when my mom died. I'm so grateful for that. Um, I've had one continuously off and on, you know, here and there since then. I have a coach. I have recovery people that support me. I guess I want to just like, again, qualify. I think it's really important to acknowledge that for me, anxiety is kind of a co-pilot. It's something I haven't, I don't really like, but it's a part of my personality. And the less I fight it or shame myself over it or think like, oh my God, why am I obsessing about a tree branch falling on my kid? What is wrong with me? And instead just acknowledge like, oh, hey, anxiety, there you are. We're chilling next to each other. And I've learned that through seeking help, like from professionals. I, I have a coach. My coach and I don't necessarily work on that. But um, yeah, I, I guess I want to just like, both are true. My anxiety is tremendous and it's manageable. It doesn't mean that you can't live life, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please consider sharing the show with a friend or rating and reviewing wherever you're listening right now. This will help get the word out about the show. And if one person can be helped by listening to someone's story here, that is amazing. If you would like to share your story with me, you can visit the website at www.backhomemedia.com slash parentlesspodcast. You can also email me at parentlesspodcast at gmail.com. Another way to get a hold of me is to find me on Instagram or Facebook, also at Parentless Podcast. And lastly, if you're a phone person, please leave me a voicemail at 623-396-6069. If you love the show and you'd like to help with any special projects that might go on at Parentless Podcast or just be privy to some special extras, go ahead and visit patreon.com slash Podcast.
did you get a coach before you were a coach? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I did. That's actually part of why I became a coach is I, I realized I had a therapist and a coach and right as my mom died, I had just decided to switch. I went to school late. I had gone back to school right after I got sober and I had just decided to switch to a psychology major. Cause I was like, Oh, people are so interesting. I find myself talking about them a lot and watching them a lot. And anyway, so it was sort of a congruent thing where I had started to study psychology. I ended up getting a bachelor's of psychology and then the therapy that I needed after her loss. And really, I needed it all. Like, I think I became an addict largely because I had a lot of voids that I was looking to fill. And and then once you don't fill those voids with drugs anymore, you start to want to fill them. You hopefully want to fill them with something more healthy. And yeah, that was a lot of how I found just healing work in general and therapy and coaching. And, and I just want to note really quickly I think a misconception that exists a lot or a question I get a lot is like, what is the difference between having a therapist and having a coach? And, and that can change depending on who you're working with. But I think of it often as, you know how with sports, if you have like an injury, you go and see like a sports doctor. I don't know what the word would be, but it's like you go to someone who knows how to like set your knee or um, rehabilitate you. But if you're just like a basketball player and you want to work on your, this is a sport I don't even play. So I'm like, work on your touchdown. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But you want to work on this skill, then you can hire a coach who can really help you to get past your mental blocks, uh, you know, a solid foundation from which to practice. So it's sort of like, and that's where as a coach, I have to be really cognizant of where is this person at? Because if someone comes to me, and they need a doctor, not like a doctorate, but like they need someone to set right a real wound. That's not for me. And and that shouldn't be what a coach does. So that's sort of a soapbox as an aside. But I think that it's really important to me as someone that both values the therapeutic world and also really values what I can give and what I've gotten from coaching and, and how it shaped my own healing journey as far as moving past my mom's death. And I think that says something about you too, that you're able to recognize, I mean, you know, the difference, I'm sure that there might be some coaches that have people come to them that really are not for them, but then they're just like, yeah, I'll coach you. I don't know. I don't know the world of coaches, but I, if I was going to have a coach, I would appreciate the fact that you realize that, recognize it and put it out there. I feel like you're there for more, maybe more of the people than for the money. Thank you. I would like to think that as well. <laughs> Give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's some other questions that we want to get into, but now that we're talking about your coaching, let's just kind of, kind of bring in, if I wanted you to coach me, what would I do? How do I, how do I get you? So I, I will just kind of note at the beginning, I don't know when this podcast will be released, but because I'm pregnant and about to have a baby, um, I'm due late March, early April. I, I'm taking on new clients right now, but if you know this is early February, all that to say, I will be on maternity leave until probably July. So just throwing that out there. That being said, I, I'm a writer first and foremost, and I write on my website. It's called Follow Your Fire Coaching. Just followyourfirecoaching.com. And I write about all sorts of stuff on there. Some of it's about my mom. Some of it's about like mindset. A lot of it's about how to stop caring what people think. But that's usually how people find me is through my writing. And then I offer the sessions. And these are like a free session where you get to know me and, and I get to know you. And that's where I really get to assess like, is this someone that I can help? And you get to decide, is this someone I can see myself opening up to? Because that's so important. And then we move forward as far as coaching goes. If you want to stay in touch with me and and possibly work with me in the future, I would just come to my website and and subscribe to my blog. If you're into, I usually email people like I used to do it every week, but my bandwidth pregnant is so low, (laughs) like every other week or once a month talking about life, how to deal with, I've been writing a lot about grief. And that's the other thing is I'm so all over the place. (laughs) Like I know I mentioned to you stuff that I wrote a book this past summer or fall, I guess. And I actually set out to write a book that really aligned with my coaching practice. I was like, I'm going to write a book for people who want to find their inner guide, like their higher self. People are always asking like, how do I know which path to take? And how do I know what choice to, to make? 
And I sound like Dr. Seuss for some reason right now. <laughs> and, and those questions, like, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll write a book that will be sort of a companion to coaching. But I was newly pregnant, deeply depressed. I think uh, I went through a really rough phase this last year. 2020 was unkind to many. And although my struggle was not as bad as many, it was not an easy year for me. And out of that grief, I actually ended up, you know, speaking of grief, since that is our kind of anchor in this show, I was missing my mom so much. Like in every corner of my life, I was just like, gosh, I wish she was here. And um, it's not fair, kind of that little girl like stomping. And I was thinking about how in my last pregnancy, I ended up carrying late, like two weeks late. And I wanted to ask my mom, like, how long were you pregnant with us? Did you have like a natural delivery or were you induced? I had all these questions that I wanted to ask her and really questions in general that I wish I'd asked her about life and about who she was before me and who she hoped I would become. And and I started to write them down. And I was like, I think this is the book I'm supposed to write. I think I'm supposed to, it's not exactly a book. I call it a book, but it's a journaling book I created. And it's just a series of questions. And part of why I wrote it. So these are questions like, what have you learned from heartbreak? Or what were you afraid of as a kid? Or if you could choose your last words to me, what would they be? I would love to hear what she had to say for that. But part of why I did it is that I'm pregnant again with a daughter. I already have a daughter and I, I get to write these. Like I kind of did it for me where it's like, I guess I do have this awareness that while I hope to live a long and healthy life, nothing is guaranteed. I would love to leave my daughter something that is just a snapshot of who I was and who I hope they become and what I might, what advice I might give in different areas. So anyway, yeah, I guess I share that because again, how has my mom's death changed my life? She didn't like come with a booming voice and say, write this book, Melissa. (laughs) But, But somehow my grief translated into creating that. And it's been this like little gift that's just found a lot of people who needed it. And, and I didn't really, it didn't make sense. Like the creative aspect of it didn't make sense to like, I don't really make my grief over my mother or even mothers and daughters a focal point in my business at all. But yeah, somehow this ended up being what was, what was born. And so, yeah, I'm happy to get to talk about it and also just share. I think that there's that paradox again, that God, I wish she was here. And I would so prefer her to just be here with me and my kids for this journey. That sucks. And I'm so grateful that she's been the impetus of, of stuff like this, of writing like this and healing for other mothers and daughters that are still alive and able to leave a legacy, if that makes sense. It does. And I totally love that because when, when I was thinking about doing this show, I was kind of, it was born from, oh, well, I wish I could call my mom and be like, Hey mom, what's this, this, and this, and this. So this is a completely different show that came out of that. But yeah, I always do think about those questions that we all have and we're not able to ask. So I love, so your book is more from the perspective of those who your, your mom is still alive or so who, who would buy this book, I guess, who, who should get it besides yeah. everyone? <laughs> Who's your specific and audience? We, you know, what's interesting is it actually, I, I found that, you know, people like ourselves that have lost our mom, obviously we're not going to buy it to do with our mom because we can't. But I know that motherless mothers have been especially drawn to this. It's called Questions You'll Wish You Asked, a time capsule journal for mothers and daughters. I'm working on mothers and sons right now because there's this huge gap. Like, of course, you know, mothers want to leave a legacy to their sons too. I just began with my little life and my experience. But I think it's a tremendous gift for anyone who has a daughter, who is a daughter with a mom who's still alive. I've seen it be really helpful for older mothers and daughters as they become, I think, you know, we can, you and I know you can always lose your mom, but as our moms start to get up there and you see age and health taking them away, I think it becomes even more apparent just how important it is to ask these questions now. And yeah, a lot of new moms, like, and maybe again, that's because of the circles I run in as a a mother of young children, but that it's also kind of nice to envision your young children grown, you know, have these snapshots of them as adults one day and talk to them almost, it's it's almost like it invokes our higher self because it's like, here's who I want to be. I know I yelled earlier, but like who I want to be (laughs) is, is someone who handles conflict like this. And this is how I hope you do it. You know, that kind of thing. 
Right. And I think that is so important because you mentioned a lot of new mothers are interested. And I feel like, and we can get into this too, that just becoming a mother gives you a whole complete new perspective of, of your mom. So I would like to say that's my opinion on why you, you are seeing, you know, new moms. I mean, you're, you just, you just don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And then you, you have this child and it's like a whole world that you didn't realize. Did anything change in the way that you parent when you became a mom? So, so yeah, I do. I have a daughter, Matilda. We call her Tilly. And then um, I have another daughter due soon. And I became a mother at 34. So it was about five years after my mom died. And and it was interesting because I, when she was alive, I was always sort of like, I don't really want to be a parent. It like, it just didn't seem an adequate, an adequate use of my lifespan. And I say that without judgment of women who always wanted to become a mom, but just more like that, just, I just wasn't particularly into it. And then I got a little bit older and my mom died and, and I found myself so curious because of being the recipient of that grand love of that, like the, the biggest love I've ever experienced, you know, the closest to unconditional, I found myself wanting to imagine or wanting to like, am I going to, am I going to wish I'd known that from the other end? Like, what is it like to, to be willing to, you know, speaking to like, you know, overlook, you know, the fact that your kid is celebrating a father that was kind of a dirt bag. <laughs> like what kind of, what kind of love allows that? So I think that, what is different is, you know, there is this absence and there is this longing. I definitely in the early days of parenthood, part of actually why I wasn't sure I should even have kids is that like, I don't have family. I don't have a mother who is going to help me. Like who's going to guide me. Who's going to be there when I'm wearing like essentially a diaper and crying and all the things that I heard about from my very honest mom friends I'm talking about postpartum, not that I wear a diaper in normal life, <laughs> but like in these really vulnerable moments when you just want your mom. And, and yet, um, I decided to just figure out how to do it anyway. And, and so I think that both acknowledging the absence and how much I wish she were here. And also that I believe having kids has brought me closer to her because in these small moments that I didn't know things you can't really know until you've experienced them, I would be like, Oh mom, like, this is how you felt. Like even something as small as when my daughter was really little, I took her to get her pictures done at JC Penney. I like really wanted like newborn pictures or I think she was like three months old. And I was trying to pick out her outfit and also trying to consider, okay, if she poops on the way over there, like what's another outfit we can bring and just sort sort of doing that mom planning. I already said I have like a planner mind, but that mom thing that we do. And after we got back from these portraits, I I looked at this picture I have on my mantle and it's of my mom, my dad, and my brother when he was a baby. Cause my dad was still around when he was a baby. So it's like early eighties browns and golds. And, and I looked at the outfit my brother was wearing and I thought, you know, mom, you probably did the same thing I just did where you were like, you know, they probably went to like Mervyn's or wherever the Olin Mills was where everyone took pictures in the eighties. And she probably did the same, like, timing thing. And okay, has he eaten? Has he pooped? And I'm bringing all this like little microscopic moments of the day up because even little things like that, it's like, I wouldn't have even thought about those before I was a parent too. And then there's the big ones, like the way you feel when your child lands in your arms or when they're sick and you're worried about them or all the things I've yet to experience because my daughter's still so young, but I know we're coming. So again, I think it, it brings up that gift that yes, they're not here. And I wish, I wish she was, but how cool is it that my relationship with her is only growing in that way? Because I understand this side of her. I often think of it like, it's like my mom lived in this house and I knew it so well, like the outside of it, like, this is what my mom's house looks like and becoming a mother. It's like, I'm inside the house and I'm like, Oh, this is what it looks like from the inside. And This is how, you know, the chair she sat in felt, I don't know, like metaphorically, it just gave me this entirely different gift of, oh, so this is what it was. And with that too, Steph, I think it gave me a lot of compassion because I mentioned she struggled a lot. You know, she struggled when I mentioned her weight, I could, I have could have cared less how heavy she was, but she hated being overweight. That was her battle of life. It shaped every aspect of her interactions with people. She thought 
so many, you know, she thought people didn't, she would be self-conscious eating in public. She felt like people didn't take her seriously. She was a nurse. She was a really smart, good nurse, but she felt like who's going to take advice from someone who's, you know, 300 pounds, like this, this affected everything. And I, I bring her weight up now because in retrospect now it's like, Oh my gosh. Like she, she had, um, she had so many battles that she was fighting and, and I just understand it more. I don't think I qualified that enough. She also had a really horrific childhood and just like her foundation was very shaky. And now I understand more why she wasn't able to just get this part of herself under control and move on. Like many naturally thin people would think is possible or, um, I don't know. I hope I'm not coming off the wrong way. Cause I, I feel like I'm focusing too much on what she looked like, but because that was such a huge aspect of how she saw the world and how she thought the world saw her, it was something I was so frustrated by because I wanted her to change it. And I just like thought she should be able to. And now I look at it and it's like, Oh my God, mom, I don't know how you did all that you did. I don't know how you put yourself through nursing school with two little kids and no help. I don't know how you raised us working nights and bought a home and somehow, you know, stayed relatively sane for long enough to get us relatively okay. <laughs> and it's just an entirely different appreciation I have for her than I would have had when I was younger. What, what is, a f- and on the question, I say, what is one thing that you would say to your parents, but really, if you have a few things that you would say, then that's okay too. Mm, this was another one that got me all, all bawling earlier. I'm really grateful. I had those questions to just like have my breakdown with and then get to come and talk to you about them. And anyway, to answer your question, what would I say to her? Well, the obvious like little girl in me just wants to say, I miss you so much. And I think too, there's like this almost like I want to share that because I have received some gifts from her death gifts, like being stronger, more compassionate, having just like a greater, I think, I think the depth of our grief for one, as they say, indicates how much we love someone. But I also think how willing we are to visit that, that pain, it, it makes us also willing to experience great love. So I think what I'm saying is she took me to a low I'd never been to. And now I also am able to get to highs that I'd never been to. So she stretched me and, and I'm grateful for that. And, and I think I already kind of said this, but I would also say I had no idea how hard things were. And how impressive it was. We bought a home a couple years ago and it was so such a big deal and so difficult. And I was so anxious. I've mentioned my anxiety and I was just like, I'm fucking this up. I'm making the wrong decision. Ah! And, and I, then I thought about, wow, my mom did this alone with no help. And, and I say no help. She had parents that just weren't supportive. So she was essentially in the same position I was. Like I didn't have parents. I, I think a lot of people my age who have done this often will turn to someone older, whether it's a parent or like a mentor and say, so, you know, when I'm looking at houses, what should I be looking for? Like, it's like, have some kind of guidance. And she didn't have that either. And so I would, I would just appreciate just like what an incredible success her life was. It was a wild success. And my mom spent most of her life thinking the only good thing about her life was us, that we were these bright spots that maybe we would go on to live lives of importance, but hers was literally, it, it's almost like she was just there to bring us into the world, which also put a little bit of pressure. That's a complete tangent. Like, I don't think that's fair for kids to think, but I would tell her like your life on its own was a success. Like I, I would give a speech about it today. I write about it all the time because it, it made such an impact. And then I get to tell my story or be there for someone else And this ripple effect, I think I have to come back to as a human that can often myself feel insignificant or like a failure, partly because, you know, I was raised by a parent that sort of like felt like that a lot. And just because of life is hard and and we are just one person and we're raised in the society where we think we need to be extraordinary or special or make some sort of impact. And, and I think that her life shows me just how impactful every life is and how, like I said, that ripple effect kind of carries out from she's been dead almost eight years, but she's changing the world through me. And I don't mean to give myself some huge grand purpose through that, but it's like, we all have that simply by showing up 
I think that it's it's important for you to say that. I think it's perfectly fair and it's fine and it's needed because you have found your purpose and I, it's awesome that you're able to to bring your mom through that too. And yeah, I don't know. I think I think you should allow yourself that. I think that's definitely fair. Yeah, thank you. You're right. I'm going to own that. Mm, and yes, as grand as my purpose can be, then it, it it's sort of like that that Marianne Williamson quote, it's like when we give ourselves permission to shine, other people feel permission as well. And, and so I will own that so that you can own that and others can own that. Yeah. I think, I think our each individual purpose is both very grand and also very ordinary and that those can coexist. And yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to my mom for that gift. Do you have, do you have any coping mechanisms and what, what are they? You have a cat. Did I just hear a cat meow? You may have heard a child be a cat. I don't know. (laughs) I was going to be excited because I'm a cat lover, but I'm also a child lover. (laughs) I have a cat in my house. It stays in, it stays in a room because it's not my cat. It's someone else's cat. So that's, that cat stays with her. I have two dogs that are out and about. So my son's (laughs) allergic to cats actually. So it's like, yeah, she needs to stay. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. That's one of my fears that like this next kid will be allergic. Cause we have three cats, but anyway, um, I'll stay focused. It was very cute. It's a cute little noise. <laughs> um, oh, Stephanie, I forgot. What, oh, it's okay. Me- okay. So I would say my coping mechanisms have changed and, and depending on the moment I'm in, in life, you know, as far as how much time or bandwidth I have, they change. But, um, my biggest one is writing. I have written since I knew how to write, but I do something called morning pages. Someone named Julia Cameron, who wrote this book called The Artist Way that I highly recommend, which is why I mention it for anyone, whether you're an artist or a lawyer or a stay-at-home mom or whoever you are. It's just this amazing book about how to unblock yourself. And one of the things she recommends is every day you do something called the morning pages, which is three uh, stream of consciousness, notebook pages. You never show them to anyone. You don't reread them. They're just like brain barf. And I do those every day. Um, obviously, when I was a new mom, that wasn't possible. But that's a huge coping thing. It's like a release of all the gunk that's just constantly floating in my brain. Um, and I've mentioned therapy and coaching um, and support. I do have a recovery community. I do have friends who are a also sober, but B whether they're sober or not are simply emotionally supportive people, which not everyone has to be become a drug addict to be an emotionally supportive person I have found, but I have people that I can turn to and be really honest with and be there for them. So those are probably my, my biggest ones. And I do meditate, but I say that also again, life doesn't always allow for these like lofty ideas of like what self-care looks like, but I have to put sort of a lot of effort into staying well, because even aside from losing my mom, I have a brain that likes to make me very unhappy and very anxious and worried about everything. And so I kind of put like money in the bank of wellness, even when things are good, because if I don't, it's, it gets kind of chaotic and I pay for it later. And, um, and that's another way motherhood has really challenged me because I've had to find ways to do that even with very little time and a pandemic and all the things that many of us are dealing with right now. What's your favorite quick little way to do self-care? I guess at like a very base level, if I'm feeling anxious, I'll do some deep breathing and I'll check in and say, what can I smell? What can I hear? What can I touch? And just go through my senses. And that'll just immediately ground me into where are my feet? That's like something my sponsor used to say to me a lot when I'd be like, how am I going to do this? Whatever this thing was. And she's like, where are your feet? Right now they're on the ground. I'm sitting on a little birth ball. It's like everything right now is okay. So for people like me that future trip or go to the past a lot, coming right here to the moment quickly, I, I highly suggest that. Just like, what do you smell? What do you hear? What do you taste can be weird if you're not eating, but you know, like check in with your body and yeah, I think that's a good one. That's nice. Yeah. What, what am I going to do about that? Gives you so much, just the unknown. I'm always asking questions about things that can't be answered, (laughs) but you can't answer. Exactly. You can't answer. I'm right here. I'm okay right now. Like, I'm (laughs) like that a lot. Totally. Totally. And really like, just to kind of go back to our topic, that's how I got through my mom's death was like, I don't know how the heck I'm going to 
have a wedding without my mom there or raise kids without my mom there or insert everything that we would think we want our mom there for. But I can brush my teeth. I can go to class. Like I, that was like one little step at a time was how I got through that. So yeah, I guess it definitely peppers into both like the really heavy dark moments and also just the ones where I'm wondering, like, I'm trying to switch my health insurance right now. And I get really anxious about that. Cause I'm like, how oh, I need to call them. And it's like, where are my feet right now? <laughs> That's important. Is there a particular smell, sight, taste, sound, uh, food, anything that reminds you of your mom? I always think of my mom when it's around the holidays, which I hear that from a lot of us that I think had maybe traditions around the holidays, um, but she loved Christmas. That was like a time she gave herself permission to to just be happy and happier. And And I guess as a family, we would always decorate and watch Christmas movies. And what's funny is that she came from a Jewish family. She just loved Christmas. <laughs> and And now I'm, you know, my partner is Jewish. My children will probably, I don't know, we might, I might have to start learning about this part of my history so they can have some... Jewish aspects, but yeah, Christmas, man, like my Jewish mom loved Christmas. So I think that, and another part of her that is always like a very clear association. She loved Scotland. We went on this field trip in high school to Scotland where she just fell in love with it. The history and the, um, the landscape, it's very beautiful and the accents. And, and then that was where she would save her money and we would go back to, we went quite a few times considering that we were middle class and not wealthy people to be able to fly halfway across the world. She loved it. And that was actually where we scattered her ashes four years after her death. It took me a while to save up for that trip, but we went to her favorite castle called Eileen Donnan. And, and I'll share this because I wonder if other people have had this experience, but scattering of ashes is not always like as I want to say romantic, obviously it's not romantic, but like, it doesn't look how you think it will. Cause I remember trying to like get to the water and like looking around, like, is anybody seeing me do this? Like dump this little box of ashes in the water. And then there was like this little gust of wind and some of them went on me and it just was like kind of comical. And also, um, it was just everything like life is everything. I was sad and it was meaningful. And yeah. So Scotland, I think that's a really close place to my heart because it was so close to hers. That is amazing. I think that you were able to go back and I have heard uh, through talking with people, honestly, is something I never would have thought of. I would have thought it was just a beautiful scattering in the wind. Was So was it you and your husband that, that did that? It was actually Michael and I and my brother. He, we all saved money and he, it was sort of like we went on these like parallel trips, but yeah, we all met over there in Scotland. And, and actually, interestingly, I, I went to like Iceland first. I went with a friend, another friend to Iceland and I had my mom's ashes in my bag. And we joked on that trip that there were actually four people on the trip because she was pregnant at the time and I had my mom's ashes. So it was like this. And, and my mom had always wanted to go to Scotland. So that's part of why I decided to stop there. I didn't scatter any of her ashes there, but then, then I flew over and met Michael and my brother in Scotland. I just like had written up this little thing. It was, it was strange. I think again, that, that moment, like it's easy to expect it to be different. That moment when you finally get to do the thing, like that whole trip was leading up to, we're going to scatter her ashes. This is the entire point. And then we did it. And, um, and it just, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. It just felt like I didn't expect it to feel. I think what I didn't expect was I got really down and then I felt better after. I have to say that the days after that on the trip, I enjoyed far more. You know how I've talked about my anxiety in our in our chat? My anxiety was ridiculous on that trip. I remember being terrified. For one, we were driving on the other side of the road, but I was already like a nervous driver. I think I had a really tough time enjoying it until we scattered her ashes. And so that's another reason I'm grateful to have this conversation. I don't think I've had it in this kind of linear fashion before, but I do think it was freeing in that sense because... I felt like I relaxed a little bit after that. Like I had let go of something and I'm not going to say I didn't have any anxiety afterward because I I don't think that's fair, (laughs) but I didn't feel as like tightly wound. Like something was able to release, which, yeah, I don't think I've really thought about before. I've never written about that experience either for some reason. It's like a, um, 
I don't know, a blank spot. Yeah. It just didn't feel the way I expected it to. Yeah. I mean, that, that took four years of your life. That was your, you were saving, you were working hard. You were, you wanted to take your mom back to where, where she loved. There was a, a large, um, I'm, you guys can't see me, but I'm like, like a large build towards that moment. And maybe like any moment, then it's like, oh, this wasn't how I expected it to feel, but things are different. I am different. I have let go of something. I also want to say I saved some of her ashes and put them in a little locket. So, so that made me feel like, okay, she's, she's never far away. She's in my heart all the time, but she's also not even scattered that far away. Like she's, she's next to my heart when I choose to wear the locket or there's like this just sort of talisman that I can keep close, which feels really good. Good. That was actually what I was going to ask is if you scattered all of them or if you kept some. So I'm, I'm glad that you kept some as well. We also kept a small amount in, she has a little grave. It was really important to me to have a place to go visit her. And there are some in a little, I don't know, a capsule, like my mom's in pieces around the world. Now, I guess she's in my locket. She's in this cemetery in Sacramento. And she's also at Eileen Donnan Castle in Scotland. You've mentioned that you've, you've been to therapy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to. I, I think it's a really important outlet. I think that having someone on the outside of our life and the outside of our grief is so important. And something I was thinking about that I want to handle really gently because I've mentioned I'm a mental health geek. And I've also, even aside from coaching, I've worked in mental health advocacy for the last five years even longer than that. And it's really important to me that people feel safe seeking it, that people don't feel any shame around needing medication that, and I also mentioned that because I'm sober and there's, there is some judgment in the sober community. Um, there can be on people who need quote unquote outside help of anxiety medication or depression or things that you genuinely need because your, your brain chemistry needs help. Like it's, it's a physical fact. So that's kind of a soapbox I stand on a lot as someone in recovery. Like it's okay to take these, these drugs if you need them anyway. And I bring that up because when I was newly grieving, I was very sad and very depressed. I have a few friends who have needed or, or are on antidepressants. And I asked my therapist, like, should I be on these? Like, should, do I need these? Because it feels like I need these. And this is always a conversation between the patient and their, their provider. So I'll just share my experience. But I remember that she, the way she kind of decided with me that I didn't need medication. And again, this isn't to say that some people don't, but is that I was doing things, even though I was deeply heartbroken and in so much pain and crying every day and all of that, I was doing things like going to yoga. I was doing things like going to meetings. I was taking care of myself. I was functioning in my particular case. She was like, I think, you know, a lot of the people I see needing these drugs, they're not able to get themselves out of the house. They're not able to get themselves dressed and in the shower, in the shower and then dressed, whatever the order of that is essentially breaking down to me. Yes, you were in a lot of pain and yes, you were deeply feeling this and that's okay. And, and I don't think you need these drugs right now. And I called them drugs. Um, my mom, the nurse would always refer to medication as drugs, but obviously uh, talking as an addict, I should make sure I decipher like medications prescribed by a doctor. But I guess I bring that up because I just, I just think it's an important conversation to have if you're, if you're seeking outside help and then take the advice of your provider, if it feels true to you, as in don't take the judgment of other people, whether that's judgment that you should be on them or shouldn't, or should be seeking outside help or should not. Anyway, like as I was reflecting on that question of, you know, if I could ask a mental health provider a question, it would be like, how do you have this conversation with people? Because I just think it's an important conversation to have. And I guess I'm also bringing it up because I think we are allowed to be in deep grief and there's nothing wrong with us. It's not a pathology. It's not something that needs to be fixed. It's pain and, and it needs to be felt. And having someone with medical knowledge and a therapeutic background allows us to not just fall into, well, this is the pain that I'm supposed to be having and have someone say, no, that's actually too much. We need to get you back from the edge a little bit. So that's another reason that I guess if someone is listening and they're at that really deep space of grief, access whatever help you can. And I hope that wherever you live, I'm talking to that person, 
you know, across the country or the world, wherever you live, that I know healthcare is a challenge and mental health care is a challenge, but it's just so worth it to have another perspective. And, and, um, yeah, now I feel like I'm talking way too much. So I'm getting in my head a little bit because I see how late we're going. So I'm sorry about that. No, you're good. I think it's going to be very important for people to hear that. So thank you. What is something you know or realize now about grief that you would like to tell your younger self? Mm. It's funny. I, I don't even remember what I said on my response to you, but that's why this brain, I guess, is a gift in some ways because I have to just be present. So what I would tell my younger self is that, you know, it's coming back because this is my true answer. It does get easier. And I don't say that in like the empty way of, I think many of us, when we first lose someone, it can be very annoying and hurtful to hear like, it'll get easier. Time heals all wounds. Any of those platitudes that I can just be like, okay, thank you. But that wasn't helpful. But it, it did get easier because I think my grief did soften and it didn't disappear. But in allowing myself to go there, like to go to the depths of despair that I think we feel when we lose someone we love, my willingness to do that is the exact reason I think I've been able to also, you know, have a really full and beautiful and joyful life aside from that. So I guess to simplify that a little bit, it would be go into it, go straight into that pain, wail and sob and scream and rage. I remember scrawling in my journal, fuck, 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 fuck over and over and over again. And I I will open that page and just see like, I had so much anger and sadness and, and whether this would have made a difference or not, I think just knowing there's a point, like go there, allow yourself to, because if you allow yourself to just keep thinking and, and despairing at some point it stops. And at some point you do stop crying, even just in that moment, like your body kind of like a little child having a tantrum or just deeply upset at some point we get to the end of it. And I think for me, that's where grace and God are or a higher power that there's some force that like picks me up and scoops me off of that very deep well of grief and allows me to like, go make myself a snack and like sit down and, you know, I don't know, do whatever normal thing I needed to do next. So go into it. Don't be afraid of it. And, and know that by going into it, it will mean you can move past it. I don't think as many people I know share with you, grief doesn't ever go away. I told you before our show, I had this big, huge cry of just like, gosh, I haven't thought about this stuff for so long. I miss her so much. God, I wish I could talk to her right now. So it's never gone, but it changes and it's different. And it's not as hard for me as it was in the beginning. So I hope that that is hopeful advice, both to my former self and anyone who might be in it in that season right now. Yeah. And that, that's so important. Um, I like to, to say sometimes that I feel like, um, I'm, I'm just barely starting sometimes because I really went a long time with really not doing anything, not doing any work. Um, so I think that is so important that you can't, you have to go through it. You can't go around it. Um, that, yeah, that's definitely. And you said no feeling is final, but you need to feel these. Mm, Yeah. That was like a, I borrowed that from, there's a poet. I never know how to say the poet's name, Rilke, R-I-L-K-E, Rilke. And um, gosh, I, maybe I'll share it, share it with you so that like, I remember it now you could include it if you want in the notes or something, but part of that, no feeling is final. And just remembering has been so pivotal for me. So allow yourself to feel it, like go there, go into that. Have you ever had any signs from your mom? Do you believe in signs? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Tell me a few. I've had a few really big ones, but the one that comes to mind is when my mom died, I inherited her iPad, which was like where she watched her movies and played solitaire and just a couple pictures of the cats. And one day I was just really missing her as I often did. And I also got this kind of weird attachment to this iPad. That's a whole nother story. I've had to just like recognize, okay, it's just a thing. It's not her. Um, cause it broke and got very upset about that. But back when it was still functioning, I decided to, she had purchased movies. She basically had a little library of movies in there. And sometimes I would just in this library, you can, you can press resume. Like she had been watching it and I could just see where she had been in that movie. And there was some 
that I wouldn't even want to start because it was like, well, when I feel like it, then I can resume and I can see the last scene that she had just seen or something like that. It just made me feel connected to her. And I decided to watch the movie Gattaca and it had the option to resume. So I pressed resume and she must have turned it off right as the movie was ending because um, I think this was the ending. There's a scene where you're just like, you just see the night sky and you just see stars. And then you hear a voice that says, maybe I'm not leaving. Maybe I'm just going home. And it gives me like, it makes me want to cry when I think about that moment. It was just so like, oh my God, mom. And I, I should also mention the night that she died, I dedicated a star to her. I don't know how I like ended up doing this. It was like a, a, a small amount you could pay to this website and name a star after your person. And so the star and the sky had symbolism. And then to have the last scene or the first scene, I guess, that popped up on her iPad be, maybe I'm not leaving. Maybe I'm just going home. It was just so comforting to me. I love that. So there's a, there's a star out there named Delise. Yeah, there is. I have a, like a little placard that says what the coordinates are. I've never, I tried to download an app that like showed you where the stars were in the sky, but that's maybe a little thing I have to look forward to in the future is maybe when my kids are older, we'll get a telescope and and figure out how to identify where this star is. And also, can I just say, <laughs> I'm sort of poking fun at this, but like who gets to sell stars? Like who decided <laughs> that I get to buy, <laughs> you know, it's like, let me name a cloud after someone. I'm going to buy this cloud or I'm going to make you buy this cloud. It, it really doesn't make sense. I think it's a capitalist joke, but nonetheless, but it you is have it. I have it. I have named a star after her. So our, our listeners can't see this, but on our screens, we have our names and the name that popped up whenever Melissa came in is Melissa Funky Chicken. And so I really wanted to, where did, where did that name come from? Why is it up there? Tell me about this name. <laughs> it's so funny stuff because I didn't even notice it until you said something because it's always there. I use StreamYard, which is the um, the way that we're like recording this, I guess, every week to to broadcast a show called Cali Cocktail Hour. And it's kind of funny as a sober person that that's the show's name. But my um, and I'm actually only doing it once a month right now since I'm pregnant. And my bandwidth has been lower, but my co-host Ruben and I we have a show, and every week we call it Feelings Friday, and um, if you go to my Facebook page, follow your fire coaching. If you're interested in watching this, that's the way to find the show. Um, but we get on there. And the reason my name's funky chicken is that I wear a chicken costume. Not every week. Some weeks I'm like, it's too hot. The chicken costume's starting to stink. Gotta wash it. <laughs> but we get on there and we talk about pretty serious stuff. Often the topics will change, but the last thing we talked about was boundaries. How do you know if you're putting up a healthy boundary or if you're just being a butthole? Like, what's the difference? That was our topic. And we have people um, comment with their perspective and we share ours and we'll have guests on. And it, it was really kind of a pandemic fun thing we just started. There's not really, for me, there's no quote unquote point, but it's super fun. And um, yeah, so that's where Funky Chicken came from <laughs> is... I dress like a chicken at least once a month and um, talk about mental health and loss and silliness and race relations. Like we go all over the place in that show, but yeah. Okay. So you said we can find you through your Facebook page for this show. Now is this a, is obviously you're dressing in a chicken costume. So this is, is a Facebook live show or a YouTube it's on YouTube or it goes to YouTube and my page and our personal pages. I, I know that on StreamYard, he's the one who sets this up, but you can broadcast lots of places. I should say though, if you want to actually stay in touch with me, my Facebook page isn't the best place to do it. That's just where this show lands once a month. And I don't know, Facebook is weird where like, even if you like a page, you'll never see anything from that person again. I've found that. So, so if you are interested in the show or um, in the blog, or if you want to one day, whatever, if you just want to stay in touch with me, um, I would just head to my website, follow your fire And there are, there's a foot footer at the bottom of every page of that site where you can subscribe to my blog. And that's where, um, that's where you can stay in touch and see what I'm offering or, you know, the I'll share on my newsletter. Like here's a really good movie I watched. I think you should watch it too. Here's a really cool playlist. Like I try to um, just integrate different parts of myself um, with with my readers. So yeah, that would be the best place to find me if you're interested. Okay. Are you on Instagram at all? I am. I'm kind of mad at Instagram because for some reason they completely locked me out for like three weeks last month. 
I had no way to get back in. That is an entirely boring story. But then they just magically let me back in. So I am on Instagram, but it makes me nervous now because it's like the whole time I was like, what do I do? I can't even get in touch with these people. If you want to come find me though, my handle is at following fire, following fire. So yeah, you're welcome to come find me there or my website too. Before we close out, is there anything that that you didn't get to say or anything else that you want to cover before we finish? I don't think so. I think I do just want to thank you for this space and for the chance to visit parts of my life and, and also derive meaning where I hadn't before. I think that's what is really cool about storytelling, whether we do it just for ourselves or for an audience. It's like we get to sort of connect dots that that we wouldn't otherwise and just be heard so i just am so grateful for this space and for what you're doing it's awesome thank you so much well awesome to be here i guess i should say all right have a good day parentless podcast is recorded in phoenix arizona find us on social media and most major podcast platforms music provided by colin lococo and the revolving birds Studio and editing provided by Back Home Media and Ian Relliford. Check out one of the many shows on our network. I am your host, Stephanie Relliford.